what the lesson is today? Re? C. Re. C. Yeah, re in the Hebrew, C in the English. Deuteronomy eleven twenty six through sixteen seventeen. Hope you read it. I read it numerous times this week, looking for a prompting from the Lord to what to talk about, what to share with you about this group. Again, I heard something earlier in the week, and then I ignored it until this morning. I ignored it all week, but when I couldn't find anything else, then I thought, well, maybe I did hear from the Lord. It just seemed like a subject that wasn't worthy of my time. I'm sorry. That's the way my flesh felt. And uh, as it turned out, it wasn't at all the case. I didn't have time then today to really prepare the lesson that is warranted. I didn't even get started hardly before it was time to come here. I was articulating away, typing away, looking and thinking, and the mind was running in a dozen different directions on subject. And I thought, wow, I waited too long. So I'm only going to give you the shotgun blast, but there was a lot of, a lot of detail in there that obviously I couldn't get to just because of time. If I'd listened to the Lord earlier in the week, I'm sure it would have got a lot more depth. I just couldn't go into the nuances and, and steady out uh, the thoughts that I had spawned from the scriptures. So you get what you got here. I apologize. I didn't have time to even edit it. I didn't usually, you know, there's always errors, grammar, and otherwise, because that's just what you're dealing with here. Uh, the, <laughs> just the dust, just the lips of dust, and uh, I'm not a theologian or a scholar or, a, or even an educated man, just a common man, and a common man with a desire to uh, see God. So here we got C. That's a good segue. <laughs> in the sea, says Moses. And I'll give you a little a re, a re, in a nutshell here. Sea, uh, says Moses to the people of Israel, I place before you today a blessing and a curse. Which there's much to say right there, isn't there? I place before you today a blessing and a curse. This says a whole lot of, about accountability, doesn't it? It says a whole lot to after you've been redeemed, there yet is a choice between blessing and a curse. The blessing that will come when they fulfill God's commandments and the curse if they abandon them. These should be proclaimed on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal when the people cross over in the Holy Land. We'll, we spoke some more about, or we will speak some more about that, I believe. A temple should be established in the place that God will choose to make dwell his name there. And in, in the final location, we find that it was Jerusalem. And in the future day, we know that it is Jerusalem. Where the people should bring their sacrifices to him. And it is forbidden to make offerings to God in any other place. It is permitted to slaughter animals elsewhere, not as a sacrifice, but to eat their meat. The blood which in the temple is poured upon the altar, however, may not be eaten. A false prophet or one who entices others to worship idols should be put to death. An idolatrous city must be destroyed. We have examples of those things in the Old Covenant. The identifying signs for kosher animals and fish and the list of non-kosher birds that were first given to us in Leviticus 11 are now repeated by Moses here in Deuteronomy. A tenth of all the produce is to be eaten in Jerusalem. 
or else exchanged for money with which food is purchased and eaten there. In certain years, this tithe is given to the poor instead. We have the firstborn cattle and sheep are to be offered in the temple and their meat eaten by the Kohanim, or the priests. The mitzvah of charity obligates a Jew to aid a needy fellow with a gift or loan. And on the sabbatical year, occurring every seventh year, all loans are to be forgiven. All indentured servants are to be set free after six years of service. Our parasha then concludes with the laws of the three pilgrimages, pilgrimages, festivals, Passover, Sukkot, and Shavuot. Shuvaot. When all should go to see and be seen before God in the holy temple. So that's an overview. There are several instances in these duplications of, of the word or the re resounding again or the amplifying of the word that refer to the animals. And that's what I first heard at, at first of the week to talk about animals. And I waited till this morning to finally get in line with what the Lord wanted me to talk about. There's one thing that I note for us, as well as for the Israelites, that should be carried through this whole lesson, and through all lessons for that matter. There's two great tasks appointed unto Israel, and now unto the one new man in this present age. <coughs> that is, we must learn to obey and learn to rule. I would suggest to you that's the theme of the entire Torah. This lesson is going to be about animals. Animals past, animals present, and animals future. It's a vaster subject than I really thought till I started into it. And uh, this is the, probably the segue into really what I always point towards, and that is, well, not always, but as of late, pointing toward the millennial reign of Christ. And so I will bring those things out in this lesson as well as speaking. And I will bring them out by speaking about animals. And then there's this one thing I'd like to state because, uh, because we have a tendency to to let some of these subjects uh, polarize us doctrinally, one to one place or to another place or to another place. And I like this quote by Dr. Hatch, and it addresses that issue. He said, at that time, which is this time, when Satan will have united thus his own religious forces, he will work untiringly to divide further the people of God by hindering the unity of those who are really Christ and one of his old and trusted weapons will be mightily employed. Even the persuading saints that agreement in creed is more important than brotherly love. That seeing eye to eye must take precedence over the possession of a common family life. That orthodoxy is of greater moment than devotion to Christ and his interests. It deserves to be most widely known as a fact not open to question that the requiring acceptance of doctrinal pro propositions or propositions as a test for Christian fellowship did not obtain until several generations later than the apostles. Dr. Hatch has indicated that the practice was derived from the Greek schools of philosophy. And then he, he uh, gives note to the Hibbert lectures, uh, the, names of w the name of which is the influence of the Greek ideas and usages upon the Christian church. If you didn't follow that, it just simply is saying that doctrine 
and creed <coughs> seems to become the most important thing in the one new man um, calling or the Christianity or in Christendom and that we let creed and doctrine take precedence over the possession of of family life or love so we, we get that's how we got all these denominations and that's how they are perpetuated is by all of this separation due to creeds and and it's just simply Satan Satan who we were to be watching out for in the last days who would take form of an angel of light and that we, we would see him come forth as prophet, and as a teacher, and as the oracle of God, we see him toward the end being more and more like that. And his basic idea, his premise, is to separate us into creeds, different doctrines, get us out of a family kind of mentality and a love mentality, and make the precedence creed. So all am I saying is, is that that we in this group need to be cognizant of not allowing Satan to polarize us and not allow him to separate us from the love of the family, the love of the family of Christ. And how we show our love to Christ is our embracing of those that are stronger or weaker in faith. And that we don't let these doctrines that we study week by week and we establish doctrine, we look at doctrine, we delve into doctrine, we research, we ponder, we, we consider prayerfully doctrine because it's important that we have the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It's important and it is that, that God would have us have that. But more than that, he would have us in a unity of love a humility that comes with, with the real true knowledge of God, not the wisdom of the world that puffs up and causes us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. So I bring that out because the subject is, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be dogmatic again about this subject, but um, I think I have a fairly good grasp uh, <laughs> given my resources and my, in my intellect and my other abilities and my age and et cetera, et cetera. I have a reasonable grasp of the Word of God and I, I feel capable and able to speak to this subject, but I'm not an authority and I know that many of the things that I'm going to say are are open for dispute and that many finer greater minds have spoken things that are against the things that I'm saying some of the things that I will say uh, I've never heard said and I but I would assume there is always a posture that can be taken that no the word says this or the word says that so I don't bring these things to light to, to establish creed or doctrine or to separate us from anybody or any way of other godly pursuit, anyone else who is in godly pursuit of the genuineness and sincerity and humility of God and his word. But I do bring these things out for our pondering, our wondering, our revelation, for the drawing of closer to God of greater revelation of his majesty and his awesome planning and his fullness and thinking and just the grandeur of God. That's why I bring these things out. And I'm grateful for any insight that he might uh, give me. And as long as I can establish that it's not contrary to the word of God, that's enough to present it forward, to lay it forth, that it can be discussed and thought about and prayerfully considered in light of the scriptures. Amen? 
So Ezekiel 1, okay? Let's just turn to Ezekiel 1. It's not a, a, a chapter that many would turn to to read because it's pretty difficult. You, you'll know. You know already. I'm sure you've all read Ezekiel 1 before. It's rather a challenging unbelievable vision that Ezekiel had. And if it wasn't for the fact that it was in the Bible and Ezekiel was a man of God, I would not give it five seconds of thought because it seemed so fanciful, so far out, so spacey, like he was lost somehow in the spirit. And exactly that was the case. But yet there's nothing that's written in the Word of God that cannot be phantomed or sounded out by the right spirit. And I'd like to bring your attention to Ezekiel's vision starting in verse 4. He says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And that's really where I want to bring your attention to. If you remember, I said this lesson will be about animals. So out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. If you will will allow me to just just make reference to Ezekiel chapter 10 you'll find that in Ezekiel chapter 10 these four beasts or living creatures are referred to as cherubims verse 8 and there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand and in verse 7 and one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims under the fire that was between the cherubims. And all through this chapter, the glory, verse 18, then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold, threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And verse 19, and the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And then verse 22, the last verse, or the verse 21, the next to the last verse of Ezekiel 10 says, everyone had four faces and every one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river Chabar. So now we can go back to this river, uh, or this vision by the river of Chabar, which is in Ezekiel chapter 1, and we know that what he speaks of here is that that he speaks of in chapter 10. And I don't think there's any reference here in Ezekiel chapter 1 that these that he's addressing as seeing in his vision are called cherubims. But I make a note to you that in chapter 10 he does. So this creature, this living creature, this beast, as it's described in some verses, they, these cherubims, have every one, verse 6, Everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man. So each one of them, these cherubims that he saw, had the face of a man and the face of a lion. And they four had the face of an ox. And they also had the face of an eagle. So then it goes on to describe in further detail this vision that Ezekiel had. Two things. One significant thing I see here is isn't it interesting that in the most intimate place in the third heaven, besides God, inside the throne area of God, we find these living creatures 
that have and are depicting something on the earth that we call animals. And this particular living creature, this thing is called a beast in Revelations, has as one of its faces a man, but the other were the faces of animals. The second thing that I see here very interesting that I can just barely or barely see is I have to take it with Revelations chapter 4 and 5 but what you can see is somehow this thing that Ezekiel is looking at it, it consists of a throne there's somehow in amongst this the throne of God and it's like a living throne with wheels turning and creatures moving and they darting from here to there and back and they're all moving in one direction. In other words, they don't turn. They just go and come. And you can see if it's four-sided, it could go and come and do this and always be going forward because it's four-faced. And, and somehow or another, if you can just visualize that there's this living throne. That's what I believe is being depicted here, is a living throne, something wherein God sits. Something wherein he sits. Now, one way we can get that picture is when we look at the Ark of the Covenant, in that we have the cherubim, on both sides and within between the cherubim is the Lord God. He is there between the cherubim. So here I believe what Ezekiel is saying is he has, is getting a vision of the, of the throne of God. And that throne is not as a throne that we would think, one with the back and a front and chairs and the le legs and he sits down on, but a living, dynamic thing that's live and moving and lightnings are flashing and movement of the living creatures and giving glory and praise unto him who sits on his throne. It's an amazing thing to just, in a little ways, in a, by, by the use of your God-given imagination and the depiction of the word, you can visualize this mighty throne. This amazing, majestic throne. What a sight Ezekiel must have saw. Then if you turn to Revelations chapter 4, it's, it's again written by John who is caught up in the Spirit. Like Ezekiel, he's caught up into the Spirit. He's caught into the Spirit up into this realm be it the third heaven or uh, uh, the heavens below, whatever, he again, he, the Spirit of God, reveals a similar sight in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And in the Greek, that is, that is literally one was being set. A throne was being set. It wasn't as the throne had been set, but it was in the midst of being set. And one sat on the throne. Can you get the vision of the, the, the moving parts to this thing? And that he that set was to look upon and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there, there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Isn't that similar in description of the amber and the light and the flame that we have back in Ezekiel? And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold, and out of the throne proceeding lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. If you go back and read Ezekiel's, 
a vision in chapter 1, you'll see that the spirits of God are there alluded to as well. And be, verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. These are those cherubims, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So there again, we have this reference, the exact same reference as Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10. And we see that in this depiction of this setting of a throne, the setting on a throne, around the throne, are these beasts, these cherubims. And at the end, I believe, yeah, at the end of chapter 5, I won't read it all, but at the end of chapter 5, Revelation 5, 14, and the four beasts said, Amen. And what I like about that is that before that, verse 13, it says, or verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessings and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. I like that, that the cherubim were able to speak. They take note that these cherubim were able to speak. These beasts with these different heads were able to speak. And, may, and not only were they able to speak, but they were able to praise God. And note that in verse 11, Revelation chapter 5, 11, it says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of of many angels around the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousands times ten thousand and thousands of thousands wow 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 I don't know someone's done the calculations that's 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 a bunch of people or a bunch of beings that represent uh, before God uh, his, uh, he's not, I don't know why I'm trying to find the right word. He's not superfluous, but boy, he's extravagant. <laughs> you know, there's no waste with God. He doesn't make anything that he doesn't use, but the, he is extravagant. Here we have the extravagance of God in his kingdom here represented. And what's right in the middle of all of that, right in the altar room of God, are these living beasts and cherubims with these faces of a man, of an eagle, of an ox, and a lion. Hmm. That to me is a, of great significance as it relates to God's creation. I'll try to ferret it out a little bit. So, that's just a brief undertaking of looking into the cherubims and their nature and their, their existence and their place, their position. And I would have had more time, I would have delved deeper into that. I invite you to. I'd like to make this statement off the beginning of that animals have covenant also. If you and I have just simply excluded them or not given them thought or not even cared, the reality is God cares and God has made covenant with animals. Not just man, but animals as well. Here's the evidence of it. God spoke to Noah after the flood and he said this, and I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you. Genesis 9, 9 and 10. 
here the four tribes or the four uh, four reflections that were indicated by the cherubim are specially and distinctly mentioned as being all of them heirs to the promises of the Noadic covenant. Thus, the promise of God remains sure that he will never again smite any more everything living as he did in the days of Noah, and the promise is made to beast as well as man. Right? Amen? It, it, with every living creature, the, it, you know, there was a reason that he brought all those living creatures on board, weren't there? Weren't there? I mean, there was a reason that he had intent in having a covenant with them as well as man. He could have destroyed the men, the man. He could have destroyed the animals, or he could have destroyed the animals and left the man. But the fact is, he redeemed not only man, but the animals. Can we take kosher animals lesson, which is in this lesson, by the way, on to another level with a better scriptural understanding of what animals are? In other words, can we grasp better the wisdom and understanding and the knowledge of God in understanding more as to who and what these animals are and represent, wouldn't it be even add more to our understanding than, than just the mere surface understanding of kosher? I mean, is, it's one thing to understand not to eat pig, but it's another thing to understand what a pig represents. It's one thing to understand that a camel or an ostrich or whatever is not kosher, but it's another thing to understand why. It's another thing to understand that uh, it's another thing to understand that actually that all things eventually will be kosher. <laughs> all things will eventually be kosher. You know, sorry, I'm really not doing anything to cause that. I don't know if that can be heard on the inner tube or not. Yeah, can it? Okay, you know, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, when I say all things will be kosher. Uh, I'm saying that as it relates to eternity in that Christ himself is not kosher to the Jew. To the Jew, there's nothing more unkosher than Jesus Christ. To, to, to say that a man can be... A, can be God. The, to say that God would be in a man's skin is the most unkosher, unclean statement to a Jew's ear. You think that you you would think that maybe pig was the worst uh, unkosher thing to a Jew's ear, but in reality, it's not. It's the Messiah. That's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with trying to convince a Jew that Jesus Christ is kosher. No, he's not. It's it's it, according to their school of thought. He is he the, the idea the idea of Jesus Christ being uh, Messiah or God in skin of man is the most unkosher of ideas. That's what you deal with. What you're fighting against that kind of thinking when you're trying to show them from Scripture that Jesus is kosher. So what my heart is, is to try to expand on our level of thinking as it relates to kosher. Where much has been said about kosher. I've taught about kosher I don't know how many times over the couple of decades here. That could be the, that could be the question of this lesson. What are animals in relation to God's intent? Well, there's no question that they are entirely at the mercy of man. Whatever and what 
why ever God has created them, there is no question that God put them under the authority of man and that presently today we see that every animal, all animals are at the mercy of man and that they have been cursed. Animals have been cursed as man has been <coughs> cursed. We'll go back to Genesis in chapter 2 and see that. And chapter 3. Chapter 3 is actually the cursing. And throughout Scripture, God holds man accountable for animals. Are you all still thinking about things I've said, or are you with me? Throughout Scripture, God holds man... I'm just going to hit on the points, and then I'm going to go back and talk about them. Scripture holds man accountable for animals. Habakkuk describes a very special evil perpetrated by the Chaldeans when they burnt the forests and cut down all the land, the trees in the land. It, will, it was a special illusion in that the outrage done to Lebanon shall cover thee and the devastation among the beasts which terrified them. God made reference to that act as something horrible. And a part of the horrendous act was that it terrified all of the beasts of the field who had to endure the fire. And it made me think, the other day I was on a four-wheeler with a guy, and we were, tra we were driving around the perimeter of his multiple acres, and... I said, is this, what is this, uh, some kind of fire break that we're on here? And he said, yes. He said, uh, every once in a while, I, I burn off everything in this dense forest floor, and uh, it comes back more vibrant. And I was thinking of that when I was meditating on this scripture in Habakkuk about, about the Chaldeans who destroyed indiscriminately and burnt and just destruction. This is not the intent of this man, but I was thinking about those animals that are within that fire break. And, you know, and you set that thing on fire, you pour gas in there and you set the thing on fire and, and there's all kinds of animals in there. And think about the terror that you create and you light the fire all around and it's like, yeah, well, Everything comes back good except those things that you burned to death inside that fire, that ring of fire. I question the wisdom in that. I question the godly wisdom. I know it comes back and looks great, but I question the wisdom of it because of the terror that is associated with those animals. Which God said that he would avenge upon the Chaldeans and which he did. And as further, there's many places I could have quoted in Scripture. I'm thinking of one that I always reference in my own mind, and that's the one of Jonah, where, and I don't think I listed in here, where in, at the end of the very, I think it's the sixth chapter, last couple of verse, maybe the last verse, is the last verse where it says that God should not spare the 120,000 men and women that know not their left hand from their right hand and the, and the many cattle and the much cattle. That told me, the first time I ever read that, I, it told me how much God cared for animals. He made a reference to it when he spoke to Jonah. You, you don't care anything about them, but I created them. And I should care, and I do care. And another reference we have in the New Covenant is not a sparrow falls to the ground without the presence and support as well as the will of your Heavenly Father. That's the literal translation, but the idea is the care that God has for even a sparrow or two or so for a farthing. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's meant by the Lord to show that the Heavenly Father has a great deal of care for you because if he has this kind of care for a sparrow, how much more of value are you than a sparrow, the Lord says. But that's not to take away from the love of God for his creation. This is about animals. This is about, this should point to 
three or four different things for you. Hopefully it resonates on several levels. <clears throat> but to their care before the fall, God was especially concerned in the creation in that in the very first chapter of Genesis, we are made to understand that while the fruit-bearing trees were assigned to Adam for sustenance, sustenance, every green herb was given for meat to the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air. You read it. I was had intent to read all of that, but I, you, you guys are familiar enough with those first three chapters of Genesis that you would, should remember this is the case. God did do that. He did create these fruit-bearing trees for man or Adam for his sustenance. And then he created these herbs, the green herbs were given to meat for the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air. And then after the fall of man, his food changed. And he too, man, was compelled to have as food also the herb of the field. It, it appears rather clearly to me from Genesis 1.30 and 2.16. 1.30 says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so that in Isaiah, or in chapter 2.16, it is also said, and the Lord God commanded, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat." Those are the references, along with Isaiah six through nine, that originally man was not intended to eat animals. That that is appears to be clear in Scripture, that man, when he was created, was not intended to eat animals. I, I don't think there's really any question that God didn't create animals for him to eat. But after the fall, that became the part of the fall, that same carnivorous spirit, the spirit of murder, spirit, spirit of lust, of flesh, was, was predominant. And God sanctioned it, that man may eat of meat. But it was, from the beginning, it was not so. He also sanctioned divorce, but it was not so from the beginning, Moses. Moses gave you that law because of the hardness of your hearts, is what Jesus Christ said. And that's the case with us eating the animals. We, they, they lusted after the flesh, and God gave them flesh until it stuck in their teeth. Quail this deep. He said, All right, you want meat there, eat. And then he sent a strong vexation upon him. Could animals talk before their fall? And you have to forgive me, I told you that I didn't edit this and I didn't particularly order it. <laughs> if I'd have gone back through it and I could have moved this here and that there, it probably read better. And so I'm just going to have to give it to you as it came to me and I wrote it down. Could animals talk before the fall? We can adduce through scripture that animals were capable of speech in the beginning of recreation as there is no mention of shock or surprise when the serpent spoke. Nor later was Balaam disturbed when the Lord opened the mouth and the ass spoke. And it stands to good reason that animals being subject, being subjects of man's kingdom would have from the rec recreation been able to communicate with man. Does that make sense to you? They're subjects, right? They're vassals. And it stands to reason that God may, made subjects that were able to communicate and speak. And then, of course, their communicative skills, as ours were, were diminished at the fall. Job speaks of the lack of the wisdom of the ostrich. Do you remember that? Saying God has made her forget. You know, she, he, he, what the reference was is that the ostrich would hide its head in the sand, put his head in the ground, thinking that if he could hide his head, he was hidden from danger. 
And so they took the wisdom of the ostrich, they hid the wisdom of the ostrich from the ostrich. Well, there's a story to be told there. That uh, that story is that, as the case with all animals, it was the case with all animals. All the animals suffered a wisdom, a deficit, the diminishing of the wisdom, as it was with man. Man suffered a great diminishing of wisdom. He made them. God made them to forget their wisdom as a result of the fall. Now, we, we understand that we're, we're operating on one-tenth. We're, yeah, we're operating on 10% or less. 10%, as Patty said, that's, that's a genius. 10%, if we're operating on 10%. We're just talking about our mental uh, capacities. If we're operating on less than 10%, 10% is a genius. Me and you fall around 5 to 7, somewhere in there then we can understand that in scale you have a fall and if your wisdom as a man fell 90 percent then you can imagine that your basils your subjects wisdom would have fallen 90 percent you see it so you you and i look at an animal as if that's the way it was created but the animal was no more created that way than you are created the way you are You have to have that in your mind if, when you go to, be think, go to thinking about recreation. And w the reason it's important is because we're not only looking back, but we're looking forward to the future. Now, Genesis says this. Now the serpent was more subtle. This is the first, first verse of chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle that were there in the Hebrew, S-U-B-T-I-L, is actually means wise, and that is wise in connotation with a good sense and a bad sense. So this serpent was wise, more, more wise than any of the other beasts or living creatures of the field which the Lord God had made. Isn't that interesting? That you and I are, are looking as this, to the serpent as some dumb snake. And the Word of God says that that serpent in the third chapter of Revelations was more subtle and more wise. In other words, it was the best it was the wisest, the smartest, and probably the most beautiful of all the beasts of the, or living creatures of the field. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, we find that God speaks then to the serpent, right? And this speaking to the serpent after the temptation of Eve is again this dual speaking that I've been speaking to you about of how God is speaking both to a man or to a creature at the same time he's speaking to Lucifer or Satan. This dual speaking by God is an example in that to the natural man and Satan, we find he spoke in Ezekiel chapter 28 and in Isaiah, in that he speaks to both the natural earthly serpent, the wisest, the fairest, natural living creature formed out of the dust, as well as that once fairest and wisest living creature of the spirit realm. Does that resonate with you? Do you follow that that is the reasoning that is very well the reasoning of Satan in that when he went to the beast of the field, he went to that beast that was the highest and fairest and wisest to, shall I say it, to conspire with, 
to bring down the, the man. Do you have something? Exactly. And he spoke first, Kathy, to the serpent. So it was first in the sin, and he spoke to him first, before Eve. Exactly. You got it. Uh, to me, it was it's just when a light came on when I was studying these scriptures, and, and what, would be a, what would be disputed is, of course, there are those that would say, well, the serpent wasn't really a snake. It wasn't really a serpent. It was the devil. We all know that. And then it goes to references of, of the devil being the serpent. But it's a dual speak in the same way that the king of Tyre w w was not with in the Garden of Eden from the beginning, covered with the precious stones and, and his voice like an organ. That he wasn't speaking to that king of Tyre at that time. He was speaking to that spirit behind the, that uh, king of Tyre. And here he not only speaks to the serpent, but he speaks to the spirit behind the serpent. But they're both in, in co-action. And what you really have to see is you have to visualize that that serpent was an it was not a, it was a living creature. It wasn't a snake that crawled along the ground. It had legs. It was, it was desirable. It was beautiful. And it fell to the condition that it's in. Just as we are, if we could compare Adam, stand Adam here and one of us beside him, there would be no comparison. No comparison on any level. And it is the same if you set a serpent that God created beside the snake, there would be no comparison. Well, somebody else kind of brought it up. Well, Satan was an anointed cherub that covered so he is six wings, four, he looked like that, right? But when he fell, we don't know what it looked like. Like that went up all that glory, just like Adam when he fell out the glory. So he's he comes as an angel of light, but he's not an angel of light. No, the the word says that when man sees him, are you what what deceived the nations? It's you, this? Because of that condition. Yes, he was, but now he is. He stands Satan up beside Lucifer. It's the same, you're having the same diminishing. You're having the same fall. A man working in 10% or 5% of his capacity, and, and that's just in his, we're talking about it intellectually, emotionally, and so forth. We're not talking about it in his power. We, how much power has he diminished in? How, how much abilities beyond just his intellect? How much more have we lost that we know not of? I think a lot. A lot of abilities. I even think the ability to transcend both heaven and earth. But that's just another speculation. What I'm trying to give you is things that are not really that speculative. They just haven't been sounded out. They haven't been dived into to to understand uh, the dynamics and when I speak about animals and I brought this subject up I first led out with those cherubim that are in the throne room of God and you got to give some deep thought and consideration to the the similarities those resemblances of those animals that God created with man and how that in a cherubim, they're all reflected in faces. So I was suggesting, was suggesting in that paragraph that it made sense, scriptural sense, that the, the one that Satan would have chosen to, to be in, conspire with would be 
as he was the fairest and finest uh, in the spiritual realm, he would have chosen he that was the fairest and finest in the physical realm. No doubt the wisest physical creation would be the natural target for that one once wisest of the spiritual creation to conspire with and be best equipped to communicate with Eve. If he, the serpent, was the wisest, are you with me? Then he would be the most capable, wouldn't he? To stealthily speak against God's word. And that is what the word subtle means. To, to put sentences together, nuances and and tie thoughts together uh, intelligently and beyond intelligently, wisely. That was the ability of the serpent, both Satan and the physical creation. Both had the ability to speak subtly. And therefore they brought forth that first temptation couched in those words of, hath God really said? How clever. Really, think about it. How clever. It's not really a boldly stating that God is a liar, but hath God really said, have you not misinterpreted or maybe God has a hidden purpose for not say, for you saying that he said this and oh, here they go. Well, the implication is that the physical living creature, the serpent, the snake, would have been the first in treason. And I chose the word implication because that is just what it is. It's implied. That the first being to whom Satan went to deceive man was this wisest, uh, subtle serpent that God created, the wisest among all the beasts of the field or the living creatures of the field. And once having gained knowledge of evil, once that serpent had gained knowledge of evil, once he had been won or coerced or deceived into believing the lie of Satan, then he himself, having now the knowledge of evil, was not ashamed to speak against the word of God. And it was the serpent to whom God first spoke and cursed. I'm talking about Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, etc., that was the first curse that was spoke was against he that first fell. Is this not evidence of a prior collusion between the serpent and Satan? I think so. The serpent was one of the class of six beings that created, then created. God created these six classes. You can go back and count them, as I did several times to make sure I was correctly counting them. He created man, and then he created the, the aquatic. Yeah, aquatic. It's funny, I knew the word but didn't know how to say it. I, I started to say he made the fish, but there was more than just fish, so I... I put the aquatic in there. It's, it's everything that's in the water that swims. And then the fowl of the air, the cattle that creepeth, and then that which creepeth upon the earth, and the beasts of the, or the living cre creatures of the field. Those are the definitions of those creatures that God created when he recreated the earth, when he repopulated the earth. I say recreated and repopulated because we in this group and have understood that there was a pre-adamant world that was before. We, by practical experience in our own time, see, 
they, the animals, have powers of intellect and emotion. I mean, each of you have had pets or have pets, and you have, you've understood how they can get so, I mean, the, in tune with man that you can read their very body language and how emotional they can be, how, 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 how much anger they can have, how much fear, how much love, how much joy, excitement. What's that? Yeah, yeah. They're intuitive. Uh, and, and in the condition that they are in, they have intellectual, they have the ability to reason and think. They are, are motivated and demotivated. They, are, they have the abilities of a human being. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> the Scott, did you say that was more than you had? <laughs> well, you get the you're getting the point that that the animals were made uh, uh, in a condition that's that even today we see by experience their abilities, but how much more would they have had? in their unfallen state. And it's not hard to imagine that they once would have had greater abilities just as man did and as man lost a great deal of his abilities and privileges along with communicative skills with his master. Didn't we lose communicative skills with our master? We, we, we walked in the day, at cool of the day and talked to him and communed. That no longer happened after the fall. And we, we, in our way, were struck deaf and dumb. And so it is that, that, that we are deaf and dumb as, uh, in the, by the loss of the faculty of our spirit, the loss in the sense of it diminishing in its abilities, not in that it left us, for we did not have, our spirit did not leave us in that day, but in the day that we died. But we experienced a separation in the day of the fall, and then that, we lost our faculties. We became deaf and dumb in our communicative skills with God, our Creator, at that time our friend, having given ear and heed to Satan. Likewise, animals lost a great deal of their skills, including communication, being struck deaf and dumb as it relates to their master. Isn't it interesting that they can't communicate with us just as we can't communicate with God. <laughs> we, they can, but it's through effort, isn't it? And it, we can, but it's through effort, isn't it? It's a, we're totally dumbed down from where we were. And so it is with an animal. And isn't it interesting that God's weight of justice is that he that heeded and listened to that spirit became deaf and dumb to him. To me, it's amazing. It goes again how God's sense of justice is so awesome and so righteous and so right. Did you have something to say, Scott? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you know, people don't talk about this, but it opens up a lot of things because, like, evidently, the, the, uh, what was it? the, uh, the serpent, God changed. He said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So he's re he's, he's saying something really profound there because God at the first said, don't eat that. Don't eat that. And now Jesus is saying the tree of life over here, which was the tree that they didn't desire, and it, and it still says he wasn't desired. Even when he came, there was no beauty, no whatever, but he's saying, That was what I meant by Christ himself is unkosher. Yeah, yeah. Even the, the many went away from that day forward, but they couldn't take that saying that 
What does he mean to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood? There's nothing more unkosher than the drinking of the blood and eating of his flesh. So he is, Christ is the, is the unkosher, uh, the most unkosher being in Christianity. You know, Jesus Christ is more of a unclean thing than a pig to an Orthodox Jew. For that same, same purpose, he, he gave his life and his blood that we might have and be imparted life. Therefore, eat no blood, drink no blood, for that is representative of something much higher and holier than you are now capable. And when he filled the Torah with meaning, he filled that meaning of those sacrificial blood, the sacrificial blood in those animals. So, man having greater abilities is hardly a question. Having lost his covering in the garden and having lost much of his original powers and even more at Babel. You know, we lost, our skills were diminished in the garden a great deal. We lost our Shekinah glory. We lost so much. But then again, we lost again at Babel, didn't we? We had certain abilities, creative abilities, communicative skill abilities, one with another, and even that again was diminished at Babel. Christ is likened unto a lamb. Does not the simple fact of scripture depiction add great value to the lambs? And for all, uh, for all animals for that matter, doesn't it? Just the fact that he's likened unto a lamb it brings a whole different level of esteem, or it should, to a lamb. Christ was the lamb, and the lamb was not chosen to be representative of the Lord because of its character. Or I should say, the lamb was chosen to depict the character of Jesus Christ in that the most distinguishable characteristic of a lamb is its humility. It is to this character that Christ Yeshua first points, as so does his description found in the epistle of Paul. I'm sorry, that's one of the scriptures that I would have looked up, but you know the scripture. When he, 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 he laid down his heavenly robes, his heavenly regalness, and he came down and took on the form of a man. That is that Christ has come as humble as a lamb. And, but on the other side, the Lord is also depicted as a lion. For we have him in scripture as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will come and come back as a lion. He'll come He's easily understood in the regalness of the lion. In the king of the jungle is the king of kings and the lord of lords. So in one hand he is the lamb, and on the other hand he is the lion. And, and the, the reflection of there, uh, the depiction is that as the creation was designed, the lamb being the most humble of characters and of great value, when, whenever humility was to be drawn upon, it was to the lamb you would have looked. What am I talking about? I'm suggesting to you that the vessels were fit for the master. Who was the master? Man. Man was the master. Man was created the master, and all of those animals were under him. And that, that they would be fit for tasks, fit for whatever use that, that man would necessarily call them to do. And first and maybe foremost, man would have had along beside him in the inner circle would have been the serpent. Because the serpent was the wisest 
of all of God's living creatures. But somewhere down the line was found a lamb and a lion. Maybe the lion was a part. Do you see what I'm saying? They Each of them had special gifts, faculties, that as the vassals, the subjects of man, that they could be used for man's purposes, whatever those might have been. And certainly there were m many pursuits that we know not of today that would have been open as opportunities for man and his, man is his joint, uh, or his subjects could have accomplished had we stayed in the state that God created us. So this, this lamb uh, is, is reflective of humility, and so Christ is depicted as, as a lamb, even into the book of Revelation, and as also as he is depicted with the regalness of the lion and the ferociousness, the, the might uh, uh, who can stand before that kind of might of a, of a lion? And we understand that these are all were the, the, the beast, the lion, and the beast is represented as one of the four faces of the living creatures noted always in the presence of the Holy One. In other words, the lion along with the ox and the eagle uh, the representative of each one of those different tribes, you know, um, the lion being of the beasts of the field, um, the, the ox being the, the, that uh, the, of the realm of the cattle, and then the eagle being reflective of the head uh, or the 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 most most desirable most uh, efficient, mo most capable, most regal. Uh, the eagle rep represented uh, the fowl. So, and that brings up an interesting thought that had I more time might have delved into is if this cherubim, and I'm sure it is, that was reflected in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10 and in Revelations 4 and 5, that cherubim was the same living creature that was put between man and the tree of knowledge. Wasn't it? The tree of life. It was put between him. There was a, a flaming sword, but also there was this cherubim or cherubims that were there that, that Adam could look and see the this representative of a living creature that had his face and these other three uh, beasts or animals' faces. These would uh, this would all be representative to man that it, it, having that had that relationship with God and having had that atonement, that partial atonement by the, the death of animals, the shedding of the blood and the covering by their clothes, the covering of their skin says clothes, stay with me, they would be then able to understand the significance of that living beast is reflective of the redemption God promised at the crushing of Satan's head. And when he looked in to what he could not attain to, that tree of life, he would also see the representation before him in the cherubim of that sure redemption for all of man and beast. I'm sure that's the case. You must understand that Adam was no fool. <laughs> Adam was of a greater in a greater state, in his fallen state, than we are in ours now. And he had an understanding of the sin that he had committed, and he had an understanding of the curse that God had put upon him, and he had an understanding of the promise of the redemption that God had in the words that he spoke. 
He under, had an understanding of what that storm, that sword, flaming sword was, and he had a significant understanding of what that living beast that was between him and the tree of life was. I told you I didn't have much time to ferret out a lot of these things, but I would that I had. Sorry. What is the significance, if not first God, the creator of all, highly values his animal creation? He's the creator of all things, that he highly values his animal creation. Though it is to us seems most dispensable, not so to God. As in the scriptures, we often see his care for them as well as us, even both in fallen state, in our fallen states. And I did mention Jonah at Nineveh being of one example. Another point worth considering further is that they were appointed the subjects of man's kingdom appointed vassals subordinate in position to man, maybe a better understanding can, can be gleaned when we give consideration to the scriptural fact that man was made lesser than an angel spirit. In other words, you might be able to grasp the rationale or the reasoning of an animal as he looks to man if, you're to cons if you were to consider that God created us less than angels. Angels are more intellect, more power, more capabilities than us. Maybe you can grasp how it is that an animal must feel if you can get in the position where you can understand how you feel as it relates to the angels. How is that? Well, I can tell you that if you saw one, I know exactly what you and I would do. We would prostrate ourselves so fast on the ground we, our knees would get weak and we'd shudder and we'd fall. Similar to how an animal relates to a man. That's what I'm trying to show you. Further consideration to understand the relationship between man and animals might be given to the past original relationship of this world's ancient ruling angels and their vassals. Here's another consideration for you that was one of my thoughts that I started down. And that in that there was a kingdom of which Lucifer ruled over before ours. And we might get a better idea of our kingdom, past and present and future, as it relates to animals, if we thus consider that Lucifer had in his kingdom vassals, subjects, of which we are not fully acquainted with. angels and their vassals as that now of the present fallen angels and their wicked demon minions. Oft I've thought, who are these? Where do they come from? Where do demons come from? Where are these devils? Where are they from? What, what are they? And Maybe we could understand what they are when we understand that God has always made a hierarchy of governments. And that if we understand that Lucifer in, in his kingdom, who ruled and reigned here on earth over his subjects, God appointed, 
that they, when he fell, they fell. And as he fell, they fell, so had man in his kingdom fall, and the animals fell. And as man is a, in the highest of the hierarchy of the new recreation, as Lucifer and the angels were the high hierarchy of that kingdom that included the vassals that we now understand as demons and devils. And even to some extent, I think, wicked spirits and unclean spirits. Are you with me? Do you see the connection? You wonder where they come from? Well, maybe another creation being in the future would look to the back and see the written word as it relates to man and animals, and they'd have to relate in such a way as we are having to relate. In other words... <laughs> It's not difficult, really, to understand the dynamics of our realm when we look at that realm that was prior to us. And that we were inserted in a realm that was already there, but we were to take dominion over, that, over this realm. But rather than take dominion, we fell into the same trap that they fell into. And we, man and animals, are just in the same sense fallen as Lucifer and angels and their minions, which were demons, fell. And to me, that's significant in my thinking as I look at the hierarchy of, of this spiritual realm that I am to deal with. I'm to deal with this realm within, and I'm to deal with that realm without. I'm to deal with learning to be obedient to God and I'm learning to rule with God. And it's significant to me to understand the dynamics of what was and what is and what will be. And this talk that I'm having with you right now clarifies in me some of those questions that I am asking God as it relates to what are these? How is that? What will be? And I see clearer and clearer all the time that these things that I'm saying to you are, are and were real. And that is the reason that God gives us the, the future understanding of what will be. And we can understand what will be better if we have understand what was. And what does it matter that we understand what was or what will be other than how we can reign and rule and be learn to be obedient in the now? Okay. Is that a very interesting week? Spiritual warfare is I know you look at been preparing for weeks now because I've been looking
then that afternoon, we get another call. Um, one of the guys that Jerry ministered to in men's group had tried to commit suicide, and he had cancer. And so I feel like the Lord, as we seek him, he will give us the ability to overcome those principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness, in order to fight for these people here. My, I know that my brother needs his soul restored. I know that he has a troubled soul, even though he's serving God in every aspect that he knows how to. But God has given us the ability, if we will seek him, he will show us what we need to do in order to fight that fight, that we can overcome that first heaven to get to the third heaven to have answered prayer for those brothers and sisters in the Lord that we know down here that are, I, I told Steve, this other guy, I said, I'm here to fight for you so you won't lose your inheritance. See, I know his history. I know what he's been involved with. And he was crying, and he could hardly speak. And he kept thanking Jerry and squeezing my hand. Thank you, thank you for coming. The Lord will put these people back in their path. We haven't, we've lost touch with him for 10 years. And, the, and another friend called and said, he's in the hospital. This is what has happened. God will bring these people back to you that you can minister life and hope to them so that they can. Satan came in to his wife. He, he, he allowed him to come back in. And the father loves him so much. It's just like when you were talking about those animals. He loved this guy so much that he told Rufus to call Jerry and say, hey, this is what's going on. And when Jerry came home, I said, I'm seeing him tomorrow morning. And it was the most beautiful experience to minister life back to him. And you had been prepared. You had prepared your heart. God had prepared you to, to, to do that ministry, and to, part of that ministry to Him was the battling of the enemies that had oppressed Him. I said, those Wednesday nights, that's what Jerry was reminding of. I said, those Wednesday nights were your acts of righteousness. That is part of your shield of faith. And you pick that back up. And you don't let Satan steal your inheritance. And Jerry and I are going to be here to back you up. And it's just, that's what God said. Praise the Lord. I know that must have been powerful to that guy laying there on that hospital bed. Oh, just commit, trying to commit suicide for devil try to take him out and steal his inheritance. And God will spare him and allowed you to go speak into his life. Amen. Amen. May God prepare us all. And, uh, well, well put that if God cares so much for the animals, how much more does he care for us We're, who are standing under a whole lot more accountability than even the animals? God help him more, did you say? Steve more? God help him. Praise the Lord. So to further understand that relationship between man and animals might be best to understand that past ancient ruling of the ancient angels and their vassals as now of the present fallen angels and their wicked demon minions. And as the case was with man that he fell comparatively to that of his vassals, so the fallen angels fell comparatively, comparatively to theirs. Follow me on that? As much as man was above animals, so it was that fallen angels were above their vassals or their subjects. Their living creatures. Whatever living creatures God had created for them, for the, fall, for the angels that were not fallen, they fell comparatively 
in that those lesser spirit beings, which I have named demons, or the, I think the scripture's name, but I have referred to here, those lesser spirit beings, spirit beings as opposed to physical beings or living souls, demons, wicked spirits, unclean spirits, and assuming that there are others of these besides fallen angels, uh, and devils, Mark 16, 9, and Luke eleven twenty six. 26. Those two references are, the one is, I believe, that I made is had to do with that when a demon goes out or a devil out of a man and he, and he comes back and he finds the house clean and all garnished <laughs> and then he sees it empty, he goes away and he goes and gets seven more wicked spirits than himself and comes back. Why the more wicked? Is that, that the more wicked are to ensure the security of his house. See, if I'm bad, but I ain't bad enough, because I'm, I, I was cast out, I need some badder boys that can do a, a, a deeper work in this living soul and cause me to have an inheritance in this man. See? So, so there's this hierarchy uh, that goes all the way up to Satan. Yet, there are these subjects, yet these are subjects to these higher authorities that we have listed in Ephesians 6.12, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in high places. Not sure that that's a, a, a remuneration of different types of ruling spirits or it's just one spirit wearing four different hats and are often relegated to the more menial task. Are you with me on that? Demons are relegated to more menial tasks than fallen angels. I'll leave that to your imagination, what that might be, because I think we're all capable of understanding. And then what may be understood in the fallen spirit's realm in its hierarchy is that attitude in the fallen nature character of man that expresses itself in the cruelty to the weaker or inferior animals. We can see the wickedness from experience of those fallen beings and that and in seeing that wickedness in those fallen beings, we ought to also be able to see the wickedness in man who treats an inferior being as the animals in like manner as they treat man. And... Uh, we should be able to learn a lesson right there. In other words, in the sense of justice, we'd like to think that we are superior and we have the right to lord over the animals anything that we desire. Well, if that's justice, then that those beings that are higher than us have every right to lord over us in every way and any way they would like, if that's justice. We don't like to think in terms of being ruled over in the way that we might rule over some inferior thing. But the reality is we are subjects to being ruled over in the same kind of manner as we have ruled over those animals cruelly and wickedly in that we have not stood in the love of Christ. That's the only thing that exempts you from that kind of treatment. And you have that choice in the treatment. You, you, you joyfully sometimes suffer some types of treatment for the greater inheritance. But those that are lost in the world without Christ 
suffer at the hands of those and they suffer at the hands of what they themselves have sown. They have sown in unrighteousness and they're reaping in unrighteousness. They're sown in wickedness and cruelty and they're reaping in wickedness and cruelty. And the word says to suffer, but to suffer for those things that are righteous, not for things that you do that are unrighteous. I'm only trying to bring light upon that spiritual realm. And while I'm doing that, I am trying to, on a lesser level than on other spiritual levels, I'm trying to instill in my audience a, a new respect and esteem for animals. And if the, you don't get anything else out of this lesson, which I think there are two or three different other levels that are more significant than that, but if nothing else, get the idea that is here painted in Scripture that for us to treat animals with indifference or cruelty is a sin. It's a sin we'll be surely sorry for. I was telling Patty when the Lord spoke to me about this, I was, couldn't help but think of my dog Pooch. It was not my dog, but it's our dog. And I have often said, and probably you've heard me say, that was the most stubborn animal on the face of the earth. And at one point, I can remember the moment, I would, had I had a knife or a gun in my hand, I would have killed that dog. <laughs> I, in, in lieu of no knife and no gun, I was even more cruel in that I beat it with a hose that I had in my hand. I was so angry and I felt like Balaam. You know, now I feel like Balaam. I feel a fool. And the dog looked up at me, not with hatred, not with pity, but the dog looked up to me what I read as, you just don't get it, look. You you just don't get it. And I look back at him and you just don't get it. You know, you stubborn. And I I can't help but I repent, of course, but and I'm not I'm in no way cruel to animals, in no way have I ever been. Matter of fact, I was telling Patty and she knows that if I had to to hunt and kill to live, I would be a vegetarian. I'm not I'm not a hunter, I'm not a killer, I, there, I am averse to that for whatever reason, not because I scripturally think that you sin when you do, it's just that that's in me. I don't want to kill. I don't want to kill an animal. Uh, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't, and I would, be, I would be a vegetarian, but I had in my heart tremendous malice toward that <laughs> inferior animal, and God forgive me. but. There, there is, you know, there's an extreme that that kind of awareness that Patty has brought to my attention is very true, and that is in the New Age movement. You know, you can take this animal thing to a, a far extreme arena that takes out of the realm the spiritual aspects and just focuses on something that, that is in their own cause for their own ulterior motives. Patty? Amen. So where was I? 
Certainly Lucifer's nature was of a superior state before his fall. As was those spirits and beings subordinate with him. As certain as it is that man's current state is far below that state in which he was created. I know I'm, I have, I'm repeating myself there. And so it may be may be understood that the, an, the natural state of animals is far above its current state. And that speech and intellect and emotion and other capabilities are easily seen from scripture as their past condition and sure hope of their future condition. Those past examples of service besides those now evident being reason speech, emotion, found in the serpent of the garden and in Balaam's donkey. We, we have those two examples, but there's others as it relates to their potential or their capabilities, even in their fallen state. Man's and animal's past and future are appointed by God to be you, uh, harmoniously interwoven, as reflected of those cherubim. On the four faces. God's creation has had, has and had a harmonious hierarchy. Scripture tells a system of government, government which he has ordained past, present, and future. Animals have their appointed place and are at the least depicted in that heavenly realm in the living creatures and appointed a portion in worship even in the most intimate places. Revelations chapter 4 and 5. And Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10. Animals are appointed a place in the millennial kingdom. They are represented to be a part of that future kingdom of Christ. Not in their fullest exalted state, but at least in a much greater state than they are currently. That we read in Isaiah 11, 6, where, you know, where the lion and the lamb lay down together, etc., so we know that that nature that they have now is no longer a part of their nature then. Christ is pictured riding a white horse as are his vast armies following him. Then seen is the fullness of the scripture of Christ's two comings. First humbly upon the foal of an ass and in the future second coming exalted upon the white steed. Those two scripture references are in Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, and then Matthew 21, 4 through 11 is the story of Christ riding in on the foal of the ass, which is the filling of the word of Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. And then when Revelation is 19, those scriptures have to do with the Lord coming on a white horse and his armies following him on white horses. I, I, I don't think at all that that is... Uh, some kind of allegorical kind of huh? Uh, symbolism. symbolism in in my mind that that there is no reason to to use there would be no reason to use that symbolism. Why why the why why the white horse and oh, because the horses and uh, in that in their exalted state have a place in the kingdom of God. Why do you think it was just a symbol of those cherubims? They were just symbols. They weren't. It weren't really a, a cre living creature there in uh, those depictions by Ezekiel and John. That they were just seen some kind of facade, some kind of symbolistic kind of thing. That it didn't have any any re relevance or meaning other than what is symbol. No, it it is it is not to be understood in that way. They are real, and they are there, and we'll see the fullness of it. Christ's atonement and redemption covered the animals as well as all creation. Uh, I think you could go to, to Jonah and read the story of Jonah and you would see that God intends in type to redeem animals. <laughs> as I quoted those scriptures that said that his covenant was with the animals. It, but it should be also understood that in antitype, which is Christ, the ark, Christ is Noah, 
Christ is that true carpenter that carpens out, makes, produces this ark in which not only man is redeemed in, but that animals are redeemed in. And you can find the reality of that in New Covenant in Romans chapter 8, 16 through 23. And here is a quote out of uh, 2 Corinthians eleven three, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And then, I'm sorry, that, that's, that's Genesis 3, 1. And then we have following, or with it, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, where it says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So, so there's no question that the real culprit was not a snake, but Satan. There's no question to that. Revelation 22 calls him that old serpent. That old serpent, meaning that serpent from old that was referred to back in the garden. Verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit. And he, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. There's no question that it was Satan who's the real culprit. Just as there was no question as to who the real culprit was behind Judas. Right? I mean, we blame Judas and we hold him responsible. And some would not hold the serpent responsible. But I suggest to you that the serpent is just as, is as culpable as Judas was. I'm, I'm trying to add to you the credibility of the things that I've said from Scripture. That it's not, not something that is spun. But if you can relate to Judas, and then you see in Scripture where it says, John 13, 27, in that he entered into Judas, Satan entered into Judas. But why and how? Because of the will be in Judas. Therefore, it's the same will in the created being, the serpent, who was the wisest and fairest of God's living creatures, those beasts of the field. Same, same dynamic yielding of our will, the yielding of the will. Nevertheless, there was a conspiring that God held both lesser parties accountable. He cursed the snake and he cursed Judas. Better had it been that you had not even been born. Nevertheless, you, you know that. Nevertheless, meaning <laughs> I, as long, we would maybe like to let Judas off the hook, and we may may be compassionate and want to let the serpent off the hook. But in reality, God has not let them off the hook, and if He calls them accountable, it's just. And as it relates to the snake, he will continue to bear at least part of that garden apostasy in the millennium. This scripture I found. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. So you see that in the millennial kingdom, God extends to the wolf and the lamb a different nature, and maybe even under the serpent, a different nature, but he did not suspend that curse and allowed and allow him off the out of the responsibility of that which he conspired to do, and he remains a serpent who will uh, be on the ground, on the dust, always face down where he belongs for what he did. He belongs humbled. Are you with me? If it was just speaking to Satan. If it was just Satan and everything else was just 
emblematic and, you know, fanciful and symbols, then you wouldn't find this curse that had been perpetrated on the snake in the garden. And then again in the millennium, it's again that, it's a good, it's again resounded that you will continue to serve out that curse that you are appropriately given because of the great apostasy that you created or fell to in the garden. Do you, do you, does that make sense to you? To me, that just warrants the idea that he is in dual speaking when he speaks both to that serpent that was the wisest of, of God's living creatures and to Satan both. And that that's bore out in that that curse on the serpent is yet the one that crawls on the earth, not typical of Satan, but the literal physical creation of the serpent continues to crawl upon its belly. Genesis 1, 24, God speaks and forms out of the ground and animals were. Let the earth bring, the word says, let the earth, first chapter, Genesis, let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. These creatures being the subjects of man's kingdom would have had in the beginning a prowess that fit their master's use. This bore out greatly in that although none was found, a search among them for a compatible helpmate for Adam was undertaken. What I'm saying there, Megan, is that the, the subjects of Adam, the created, were of a, such a prowess such of high abilities and skills fit for their master's use, for Adam's use, that among them was looked for a helpmate for him. Would they have looked for a helpmate in something as, as unworthy as, as some being with the, had no abilities in comparison do you, you, you now follow what I'm saying, Megan? Think of it also in this terms that when we compare man to God and we compare animals to God, then in that way we compare animals and men, that there's not very much difference between the animal and man when you're comparing them to God. <laughs> So there's this vast span between a, a man and God and it's such a vast span that when you compare the span between animals and God, man and animals are not that far apart. Does that make sense? And so it was that in those basils, in those subjects that God had appointed for man to rule over and rule with, they looked among them for a helpmate and none was found. But just the fact that they were looking among them shows you the prowess or prowess of those created living beings. They must have had quite com great compa capabilities also. Where was I? Where is that on the page? Some... Yeah, I got it. But man was created differently. He was created differently. An, um, animals were created in a certain way. But man was created differently. And the scripture says they were created in the image of God. Created he him. Formed out of the dust of the ground, just as the animal. And breathed, though, into the nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So it is, and unto man God subjected all things in the world's creation, thereby distinguishing greatly from animals who were brought into existence with re less regality and nobility, in that man was intimately formed in his image and life was breathed into him. That's the significance that sets him apart. 
in that he's made and formed in the image of God, but he was kissed by God as well. No other animal was kissed by God. That which has to do, that breathing into him, that which has to do with the gifted ability of the spirit, thereby becoming a living soul. It was that impartation of life within him that we align the thought of spirit with. And although as a result of the fall, both man and animal return to dust in corruption, as you can find that several places, but the one most clear I think you can find is in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and both descend into Hades. Here's where will, there will be some pushback from some when I declare to you that word gives, gives more than enough evidence to show that both man and animal descend as living creatures, as living beings, they descend into Hades. They not, their bodies all, both, the bodies of animals and the bodies of humans all go to the dust by which they were created. That's clearly brought out in Ecclesiastes. And it is also said of the man that his spirit goes to God who gave it and to the animal it says whether it goes up or down, who knows, Solomon said. Question mark. The point is that these living beings, these animals, these vassals of God, the kingdom to come, sure to be, as deflect, reflected in Isaiah in that the lion and the lamb, etc., etc., surely all go into Hades, the place of the dead. The place of the dead is not exclusive to man, where we know that also there is a cavern deep within the Hades that houses those fallen spirits. Spirits, Peter says, in contrast with living souls. Spirits are, men are not spirits. And they're not ever referred to as spirits. But Peter declares that in Hades there is a place called Tartarus that the spirits have been chained. But we know Hades is not exclusive. Matter of fact, it wasn't even made for man, nor for animals. But Hades is the place of the dead. And that these living creatures are more than just animated dirt. God holds them esteem. They the demons were held in esteem and they were more than this, the vassals of the subjects of the angels and so are animals more. And they will have eternal life. They will live forever just as a living soul will live forever. <coughs> have existence forever. Not necessarily have life and life more abundantly, but they don't fade off into nothingness. A dog doesn't die and then just forever is nothing. That dog was a living creature God created and formed him and in him was animated. He had a soul and that soul went to Hades. Mark it down. As sure as Christ rides in on a white horse, as sure as there are now in the heavenly places those things that at least depict animals and I suggest that that are animals and are called beasts and living creatures that are able to speak praise be unto God. If they're there, they're there. Waiting for what? The redemption. All creation groans. It's waiting for the redemption of the sons of man. All creation, Scott. All creature, all creation. Everything that fell under the curse.
And although as a result of the fall, both man and animal return to the dust in corruption and both descend into Hades, animals' hope for resurrection is tied to man's glorious, glory-filled resurrection. And that's why they yearn. That's why they groan. That's why they moan. They're waiting for the adoption of the sons of God. For their redemption is tied intrinsically to man's. Without man's redemption, there's no redemption for his vassal. <laughs> his subjects don't get off the hook. And those all redemption, of course, as a result of Christ Yeshua. And the word is in, found in, in uh, Romans chapter 8 where it says, For the earnest expectation of the creation which for the waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. What is the bondage of corruption if it's not the death and the grave? Into the glorious liberty of the children of God, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, the first resurrection. That is what the animals await for. That's what all creation waits for. Romans 8, 19 through 23. And then Revelation 6.13 says, And every created thing which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth. That pretty much carries, covers everything. And on the sea and all things that are in them heard I saying unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb be the, be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. Revelation 6.13. So that's it. That's a, I have to put a period at it, but I have to tell you that if you would have had probably another half an hour to 45 minutes had I not drugged my feet during the week looking for something more fit for this elite group. And as it turns out, there was much, much, much eliteness, much meat, much much spiritual undertakings there in that uh, discussion of the animals. It's, it is a very broad subject that I hope to explore further in the future, and I'm pretty confident that something inside of me says there's specific reasons and specific animals that are appointed unto the sacrifices that we call kosher that have to do with things that I've been speaking to you about. And the breaking down the, the, the beasts of the fields as to, to that tribe or that category as opposed to the cattle. Cattle. God made cattle. That's a whole arena, a whole field, a whole tribe all of its own. And cattle being that particular animal that was acceptable that, that God allowed to be uh, used in, in the tabernacle, in the temple as blood sacrifice. So, the, yeah, the red heifer. There, that what my, my point is, is that there's significance in the hierarchy of God's creation that goes back to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 that reflects the rationale of God in the sacrifices in the tabernacle, both in the Old Covenant and in the, the millennial period when Ezekiel's temple is instituted. There's wisdom, there's understanding that God would give, I believe, if we dug into that to find. I believe it was there. I, I would have. That's my natural tendency would have been to go that direction since it is in C, Ray, that we find this duplication of the law as it relates to kosher, as it relates to slaughter in Jerusalem only and nowhere else for sacrifice. All of those things I would have been able, hopefully, to have found some light. I'm sure they're tied together. There's significance there that I just don't know what it is, but I'm thankful to God to open up uh, my understanding somewhat. Hopefully, it did yours. Thank you again to this group for attention.